Happy holiday weekend to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, welcome one and all. It is four o'clock on Sunday, uh, and that means uh, Tailupka uh, Wine School is in the mix uh, with you all, hoping uh, to brighten everyone's day here. Um, just admitting you all for the sake of the waiting room. Um, welcome one and all. Um, yes, I am wearing a t-shirt with my face on it. Uh, um, you know, those of you for, uh, who are looking for signs of the apocalypse, look no further. Uh, I'll have a word of explanation um, uh, very shortly. Um, once again, happy Memorial Day to you all. Special welcome to any veterans in the mix. There is a long and proud history of uh, wine drinking uh, in the service ranks. Uh, we're celebrating and uh, we thank you all for your service. If you have any veterans in your family um, today uh, of all days, uh, thank them uh, for their service. Um, for the sake of provisioning, um, all sorts of options uh, this week. We are celebrating the kind of sheer astounding diversity, the wealth of native grapes that come to us from green Spain, the northwesterly most corner of the Iberian Peninsula. And um, very special place uh, for wine. We have uh, a couple different options, or we had a couple different options for the uh, sake of uh, two wine packs through our store, uh, representing different native grapes, um, both white and red. And we're gonna get to both. Um, really gonna zero in on, focus in on the individual bottles and uh, try to tell some of the stories of the people that are producing. Uh, these wines because uh, at the end of the day wine doesn't make itself it is much about uh, the people um, who are putting uh, this you know very special libation in the bottle uh, as it is about um, you know uh, the juice uh, itself singularly. Um, I love about Galician wines that they um, defy the conventional image of Spanish wine. I think to the extent that people think of Spain they think of these like dense brooding uh, muscular red wines, and uh, Galicia does not give you that. It gives you something more summery, something fresher, something more fun. Um, it is historically, geographically, a bit of an anomaly uh, when it comes to, um, you know, Spanish culture and certainly Spanish viticulture. And that is something that uh, I look forward to celebrating for the sake of today's class. Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, again uh, to you all. Um, Sarah Thompson uh, is with me, um, as always. Uh, she actually has a couple different wines. Um, I was hoping to wear a t-shirt with Sarah's face on it, but uh, circumstances did not align. Um, at any rate, um, it is a pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you to those of you who are provisioning uh, through our online store. I'm coming at you uh, from our Revelers Hour uh, studio. Uh, a shout out to all of you who took a chance at the tail end of the week and let us choose your Galician wines for you. Uh, I promise to really focus again on the bottles themselves, on the wines themselves for the sake of today's class and use that as a driver for our narrative uh, over uh, the course of the hour uh, to come. Once again, happy Memorial Day to you all. I hope um, you're outdoors and grilling uh, and uh, celebrating uh, those among us uh, who served our country. Um, without further ado, I have all sorts of announcements to kick off this lesson, please bear with me. First and foremost, happy birthday to one Zoe Nystrom. Uh, she is listening, uh, muted in the dining room remotely. Um, she uh, runs the roost at uh, Revelers Hour uh, for the sake of our beverage program. We are hugely lucky to have her. Uh, happy birthday to you, Zoe. Uh, happy birthday belatedly to my mom. Uh, that was yesterday. Happy birthday to all our May birthdays. Um, I have quite a few in my life. Um, it is a, a special uh, a month, uh, broadly. Um, more announcements to come here. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, the uh, kind of response that you all um, have uh, given me, given us for the sake of this class has been inspiring. Um, your level of interaction, um, you know, the degree to which you invest in this uh, each week and um, just ask amazing questions and, um, you know, have made this a part of your lives is, is truly uh, humbling. Um, for those of you uh, just tuning in, yes, I am wearing a t-shirt uh, with my face on it. Uh, you have Christian Connor to thank for that. Uh, here's to you, uh, Christian Connor, uh, for making that happen. Uh, I am definitely the guy that is wearing the t-shirt of the band to the concert. 
Uh, don't be that guy. Um, I think future viewers will cite this as the moment when uh, my show started to come off the rails. Uh, when he started wearing t-shirts with his face on them, guys, that's really when he jumped the shark. That is the Raymond Simone on the Cosby Show moment for Tail Up Goat Ryan White. Cool. Uh, thank you, Christian. You've been an amazing champion. Uh, we love you, buddy. Um, Susanna Young, um, you uh, baked an amazing uh, apricot chocolate ganache tart, uh, which I courageously and lustily ate at home without sharing with the staff. Uh, she did this uh, with the Georgian orange wine from our class. Uh, so uh, she did me one better on Sutter Home and found a innovative use for Georgian orange wine in a uh, apricot grenache tart, which was hugely delicious. Um, and with her permission, hope to share uh, the recipe with you all. It was amazing. Um, my wife and I enjoyed that last night, finishing up a movie. And then uh, lastly, Lisa Marie uh, Romano. Um, uh, just a, a side note, I, I have the wine you were looking for, the carte blanche. I managed to track one down, but uh, she is hosting an after show. So Andy Cohen, fuck you, buddy. Uh, I've got an after show. I have a fucking after show, man. Very exciting. Bravo. Eat your heart out, baby. Um, we have like a program suite here uh, at uh, the Tail Up Goat Wine School. Um, thank you uh, all. Uh, this class is, um, you know, all the more special uh, because of what you all have invested in it. Um, without further ado, uh, let us move on. Uh, to uh, Galician wine. Um, I, I should say, uh, I, Sarah, you were supposed to break in here, but um, for those of you that want more engagement, that want to drink more wine with us, i um, proud to announce a new regular Thursday feature, um, Flying Blind, Flying Blind, um, uh, with yours truly, uh, with Sarah Thompson, and with Zoe, whose birthday it is. Um, uh, Sarah and Zoe have picked out two wines uh, for everyone to blind taste it, you can purchase through Reveler's Hour. Um, we will have them available to purchase just this week through uh, Tail Up Goat because Reveler's won't be open uh, Wednesday and Thursday. But um, if you want to tune in, uh, I have no idea what these wines are. Um, you can find out, um, you know, uh, how good I am at my job, uh, whether I'm totally full of shit uh, when I say that I can, you know, identify these things, um, you know, totally um, in the dark. Uh, and when I talk about typicity when it comes to wine, um, you know, you can get a better sense of whether um, I actually know what I'm talking about. And we'll talk about what it is to blind taste the wine. Um, it is a fun way to fall ever deeper uh, down um, this rabbit hole. Um, brings us uh, to uh, today's rabbit hole, which is uh, Galicia. Um, as always, uh, a bit of verse uh, for you all. Um, the uh, Galicians have their own language, um, which I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, and a long tradition of amazing poetry. Uh, this is from one of their foremost modern poets, uh, Rosalia de Castro. Uh, it is called, uh, in Spanish, El Tiempo Pasa. She wrote both in the native Gallego dialect and in Castilian Spanish. Hour after hour, day after day, between the ceaseless vigilance of earth and sky, life the torrent that hurls its spray, life passes by. Give back the flower to fragrant scent when it is dry, from the waves that kiss the seashore, and one by one caress it as they die. Go, gather all the murmurs that are spent and on bronze plates their harmonies inscribe. Years that have passed, laughters and tears, black torments of despair, sweet lies, alas, where have they left their memories? Alas, my soul, oh where? Uh, bit of verse, a little more bittersweet um, than you know, we are want to share here. Um, but uh, it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite uh, Sunday poems that is, uh, Sunday morning, arguably the most famous poem about Sundays uh, from um, the inestimable Wallace Stevens. Uh, Wallace said uh, in that poem, death is the mother of all beauty. And there's a lot of truth to that. Um, Galicia is a fascinating region. Um, it has um, a bit of a sad uh, history uh, for the sake of, um, you know, oppression uh, from Franco, who ironically was born in Galicia, but suppressed um, the local culture um, and language and just mass exodus of uh, farmers uh, because they couldn't find work there. Uh, yet out of that pain, um, which is writ on the land and on its people comes this abundance of culture, this abundance of joy, um, which we are gonna celebrate uh, for the sake of um, wine today. And, and you know, that um, duality, um, I, I think um, is worth celebrating, especially at a moment like this. So um, let's start with Spain. Uh, without further ado, um, uh, I was a Latin American history major and, and you know, to the extent that you um, explore 
uh, the history of the colonies or former colonies, you have to explore the history of the mother country. Um, and uh, Spain um, is a confederation of uh, former kingdoms uh, and autonomous republics. I don't think people commonly realize that about Spain. This is a delightfully colorful map. Um, bonus points to uh, whoever put it together. They really, you know, explored this space. Um, at any rate, um, the purple areas here are essentially countries uh, unto themselves, uh, most famously uh, Pais Vasco, um, also Catalonia, which has held uh, many a recent referendum on the subject, but uh, less well-known uh, Galicia. Um, you have to imagine here that um, geographically you're essentially separated from uh, Spain. So there are a range of mountains that run north and south um, and kind of, uh, you know, southwest and, and northeast that separate Castile from Asturias and Galicia. And Galicia historically has um, more in common, uh, essentially, with Portugal um, to the south than it does uh, the rest of Spain. Um, funny thing about uh, Galicia, um, culturally at least, um, there's a huge Celtic influence. Um, this is one of my favorite contemporary Galician album titles. Uh, they have fucking bagpipes in Galicia. Who knew? Um, you go, Christina Pato. You make all the traditional Galician music. Um, so uh, there's a huge guy, there's a huge uh, Celtic influence there um, uh, going map happy uh, today. But uh, the, um, the Celts, um, they uh, ran the roost uh, fourth century uh, before Common Era. I um, mean, get a sense of the, the furthest extent of their empire. It wasn't much of an empire for very long, um, but uh, their most famous readouts, obviously Ireland, Wales, um, the Highlands, everybody knows about that, but um, there's that quirky little corner of Brittany and Spain um, that also bears a huge Celtic influence. And uh, linguistically, uh, Gallego and Portuguese, uh, which developed in close consort, um, both um, have a strong input um, from, or both have a strong influence um, from uh, uh, Celtic languages um, and um, are uh, kind of uh, very closely related um, to uh, modern forms of Gaelic in their own right. Um, geographically, um, Galicia is green Spain. Um, it is both wetter um, and significantly uh, cooler uh, than the rest of the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Um, it is the land of 2,000 rivers, um, if you will. It is um, pocketed by these uh, deep uh, canyons. It is absurdly uh, beautiful uh, a place. Um, but the soils are very poor. Um, it gets, can get in places, you know, uh, 40 to 50 uh, inches of rain a year. To put that um, in perspective, uh, last year in the Washington area, uh, we got, you know, somewhere in the realm of uh, 60 to 70 uh, inches uh, of rain. So maybe not quite as wet as the kind of most historically wet year on record for us here, um, but um, certainly not as dry as most wine regions uh, are. Um, that means they can grow a lot of grapes, um, but uh, it can be difficult to make a uh, great wine uh, in Galicia. What they have going for them is, um, again, this topography, these um, very steep river valleys, which have to be terraced. Um, the Romans were really the first to introduce winemaking to the region. Uh, the Celts drank wine very nicely done, uh, mom or dad there, uh, for Sarah Thompson. Um, the uh, Celts were the first to introduce um, wine drinking, um, but they didn't make much wine themselves. The Romans were the first to introduce wine making um, on any scale, and uh, they dug out uh, terraces uh, into the Galician uh, countryside, and uh, that kind of like terraced uh, viticulture is still a hallmark of um, the region today. Um, these are terraces in a subregion of Galicia called Ribera Sacra. Um, get a sense on this picture. Uh, a, it is again, you know, cartoonishly uh, beautiful, but uh, you can see this ladder here. Um, that is essentially going straight down. The ladder enables them to climb this vertiginous slope and um, pluck grapes uh, at harvest. Without it, um, they couldn't easily um, ascend the slope um, to uh, pick the grapes uh, when the time. Uh, comes and one of my favorite expressions about making wine uh, in Galicia is this notion of uh, viticultura heroica, so heroic viticulture. The lengths that people go through in terms of cutting these terraces out of these steep granite and slate hillsides to make these profoundly uh, delicious uh, and special wines. Um, flash forward uh, from the initial uh, Roman 
uh, colonization uh, through to the Middle Ages, and uh, Galicia remained um, an important winemaking region, but it was mostly through the ages um, of uh, the church. And Galicia is very significant um, for the sake of church history um, because of uh, one uh, Saint Iago, or uh, Saint James, uh, if you will. So uh, there are various stories, but uh, Saint James, one of the earliest um, of uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, was said to have somehow, or at least his remains, uh, said to have somehow made their way from Jerusalem uh, to um, the westernmost corner of Spain in Santiago de Compostela, and um, the uh, relevant uh, local clerics erected a cathedral um, in this westernmost um, area of the Iberian Peninsula, and it became a hugely important pilgrimage destination uh, for um, believers throughout the Middle Ages. Um, you could either go to Rome, you could go to Jerusalem, or you could go to Santiago de Compostela. And um, famously today, um, all sorts of tourists will walk the Camino um, to uh, trace the steps of those medieval uh, pilgrims. Once upon a time, um, you know, they were looking for indulgences. Nowadays, they're looking for, you know, uh, pictures um, and memories and, you know, delicious uh, octopus and potato stews, um, you know, worth pursuing in and of their own right. But um, for the sake of winemaking, this is significant because you can imagine, um, you know, all sorts of monks, religious officials coming from uh, France and bringing with them, um, you know, in lieu maybe of uh, money for a stay at an inn, um, clippings of vines. Um, so uh, you see all sorts of varietals um, from throughout Europe that uh, were brought to uh, Galicia from other um, kind of parts of the continent, uh, both from the um, south um, and uh, largely uh, from the east um, as well. Um, flash forward from there uh, into the modern era. Uh, Galicia was honestly more of a wine lake, so it was more of a source of bulk wine uh, than it has been uh, prestige wines. There are a few exceptions. Uh, there's a small subregion called Rivero, which makes a uh, dried grape wine um, called Tostada, uh, from a grape that many of you are enjoying called uh, Trechadora, um, which um, Sarah has uh, to her far left there. Um, you know, that enjoyed a brief vogue in the 17th century, but largely speaking, you're talking bulk wines. Um, and the traditional form of viticulture in Galicia um, involves these tiny family estates, pavos, or uh, mini fundios. Um, and uh, traditionally, the way of training the vine would be on these high pergolas. And that would keep the grapes themselves in a very wet region, uh, protected from the moisture that would collect uh, near uh, the floor of the vineyard, but it would also allow you to maximize the use of your acreage on a small family farm. So if you had your vines trained to pergolas, uh, which are very efficient and tend to be, uh, for the sake of many grapes, very productive, you could also plant potatoes uh, to go with your octopus or any number of other crops. Uh, Pimiento de parrón, another, uh, you know, locally famous, um, you know, vegetables uh, you could work with um, as well. Um, it is not a region of uh, proud landed gentry. There are no castles in Galicia. Um, it is small holdings. And, um, you know, to the extent that uh, you have a new generation of winemakers resurrecting um, these smaller plots, uh, they are doing so um, by buying up abandonados. So, you know, in the 19th into the 20th century, if you could, this is a region you got out of. There was no possibility of earning a living uh, there easily. And, you know, if you were upwardly mobile, if you, you know, wanted to make something of yourself and learn something, you went to the city. You didn't stay um, on your tiny uh, ancestral estate um, and make wine. But a uh, wonderful thing has happened, especially since Spain joined the European Union, and uh, that is that you have a new generation of winemakers that are rediscovering all the amazing native grapes that Galicia has to offer, and they are rediscovering the amazing winemaking traditions that have always existed there, um, but uh, had fallen on hard times. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's taste some wine. Um, we are going to start um, with the uh, first Aborino uh, that we were offering online, and you know, consistent with my promise uh, to uh, focus on um, you know, stories and people. Um, we are going to start with uh, Lagave Pintos. Now, uh, this is not the wine I have. I have Do Ferrero. Um, but uh, we're going to start with, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Thompson. Uh, beautifully, beautifully done there. Um, so uh, it is the wine that Sarah and her folks 
uh, are drinking. Now, this particular bottle, um, it comes from one of the five major subregions of Galicia, uh, which is Rias Paisas. So I've shared a map of Galicia here, um, the northwest corner of Spain. Rias Paisas is the region um, that is divided further into five subregions, which is maddening because no one really gives a rat's ass about um, two of the five subregions. Um, there are kind of hangers on. Um, the three major subregions that actually deserve numbers here um, are all significant in their own way. But for the sake of our wines today, we're going to talk about um, uh, the subzona Valle Salnes, which by far is the most uh, significant of the bunch. So you're just north of Ponta Verra. Um, you are uh, spitting distance from the sea. And because you have this Atlantic uh, coastal influence, because you have the sea spray uh, blanketing uh, the vineyards, um, temperatures are cooler um, and uh, the climate tends to be wetter. So you're getting closer to 50 inches of rain as opposed to 40. Um, and uh, the wines are a little leaner, a little racier. Uh, Albarino has much to recommend it as a grape. Um, it is hugely aromatic. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that's one of the appeals of Albarino. Albarino was really the first breakout star of this larger region. It was the first grape that people latched onto that is native to Rias Baixas, native to the subzone uh, of Galicia, that people um, were able to um, identify with um, the uh, region of Spain uh, itself. Now, it can be made in many styles. Um, so the two that we have, because they're from the subzone of Salnes, within the larger region of, of uh, Rias Baixas, they have more of a bright, briny, kind of maritime uh, style uh, to them. Um, they are made uh, by a proud daughter uh, of the region, um, uh, Marta Castro. This is Marta. Um, you can see her pergolas um, in the background there. Uh, she left um, Rias Baixas. She left a family estate that had been making wine for um, over a century and a half. And, you know, she was of the mind that, you know, I want to get the hell out of this small town. Um, but, um, you know, a funny thing happened to her as she uh, got older and she came to develop a fuller respect for what she had left behind. And she came back um, to revive uh, the family estate. And she's working with many different parcels, but vines that age, um, a range in age from uh, two decades to uh, some two centuries uh, old. A lot of these pergola trained vines um, do get uh, very, uh, very uh, old. Um, she is someone in her wines that wants to maintain a certain amount of freshness, um, but also wants to give uh, her wines uh, some substance um, as well. So she blocks on her wines uh, malolactic fermentation. So that, you know, kind of secondary part of the fermentation process that we've talked about that's carried out by these uh, bacteria that are not the yeast that initially convert sugar into alcohol. There are different bacteria that converts um, malic acid, which tastes like green apples, into lactic acid, which tastes like yogurt. Uh, she inhibits that, but she does something else to give her wines more richness than they would have otherwise. And it's very common for the sake of Alvarino. She leaves the wines on the lees, and not only that, but she practices batonage. So she leaves the wine on the uh, dead yeast cells left over after fermentation, and she does what the French call batonage, which is stirring of the lees. And that imparts a richness and a wonderful breadth of texture um, to her offerings that they wouldn't have uh, otherwise. So it's kind of a, a fun push-pull. So on one hand, she wants to keep things bright and fresh, and she's inhibiting you know, that, you know, layer of opulence that you can get through malolactic fermentation. But on the other hand, she still wants to give some things some weight. Um, and, you know, that's why she stirs the leaves. And I think that's kind of a, a fun push-pull. You know, she's seeking that, you know, uh, middle ground um, in a really, you know, kind of wonderful way. Um, my one um, comes from uh, a different uh, producer. Um, he's been making wine uh, a little longer um, in the region. He's kind of, um, you know, of the new generation, one of the old guard. His name is Gerardo Mendes. Um, and Gerardo um, started making wine there in the 70s. Um, you can get, you know, this is an older uh, pergola trained vine. Um, for the sake of the Do Ferrero, um, this is kind of their entry level cuvee. It comes from 50 plus year old vines uh, universally. He is someone that um, gives the same lease contacts um, uh, as Marta does with her wine, but she does, he doesn't stir as much. So. You know, he's not going to stir the lees, he's just going to kind of let the wine hang on the lees. So that gives a little richness, but maybe not quite as much as you get if you're agitating 
uh, those lees throughout the wine making uh, process. And you know, if you think about that, like you know, um, you know, making tea or making any other infusion, you know, there are a lot of variables there. But uh, the more you agitate something, um, the uh, more uh, actively um, that infusion uh, proceeds uh, for the sake of what you're working with. Um, I love Albarino because um, it. I think, you know, done well strikes this wonderful balance between this like fresh maritime salinity, its purity, and also a bit of opulence. Um, Thompson, I'll let you speak uh, to yours since, you know, I'm not trying the Lagar or let your parents shout some uh, tasting notes at us from afar. Um, you know, uh, in your mind, having tried Albarino, no, is this, you know, like a more Chablis-like Albarino or is more Montrachet-like kind of Albarino? More Chablis-like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and there's something, you know, for me is very familiar uh, about Aparino. It's not maybe a wine that asks a lot of you, you know, it's, it's not, you know, there's nothing, you know, it's not a natty wine, you know, it's, it's not, you know, uh, gonna, you know, stop you in your tracks. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, just kind of look, gaze into the depths of this glass and, you know, think about the wine for hours on end, but it's pleasant. You know, it's immensely pleasant and it's immensely satisfying. And it's a great food wine um, because it has that racy acid, um, which it retains as it ripens really well. Um, and also because um, it has some, some weight. Um, so, you know, those wines that are both acid driven and a little weighty, you know, they are skeleton keys uh, for the sake of pairing. You know, in my mind, um, the Dauphin the, the, uh, Dauphin Rail, um got a lot of that bright briny uh, dimension on the nose. Um, a lot of like green apple, uh, but there's something, you know, a little more opulent about it on the back end, something, you know, even, you know, kind of wonderfully tropical um, about it uh, on the finish that I, I think is, is hugely, hugely refreshing. Sarah, do you have any questions um, about the Albarino's and rings? Yeah, um, so, well, not about the Albarino itself, but um, in terms of the, the vine age. Yeah. Uh, Kate's asking, uh, you know, she thought that vines were only good for 20 to 30 years. What are, what's with vines that are 100 plus years? Um, to still produce viable grapes. Yeah, it's like, how do we define good? You know, when, <laughs> when do we put, you know, grandma and gramps out to pasture? You know, it's like, uh, so maybe they're not as productive as they once were. Maybe they don't get around as fast as they used to, you know, as they used to. But, you know, uh, it if you, you know, ask them the right question, if you, you get them in the right setting, you know, they're hugely interesting. You know, they have a lifetime worth of stories to tell. So vines work the same way. Um, they get progressively less productive uh, as, they, uh, as they age. Um, that is universally um, true of almost all living things. Um, so uh, in a commercial setting, yes, um, very often producers after 30 years, after 50 years is a, a typical benchmark. Um, you know, the yields on uh, the fruit are not sufficient to sustain commercial viticulture um, profitably. Uh, but um, the, the fun thing is that um, as your yields get you know, lower and lower, um, the fruit um, that you are plucking in smaller and smaller quantities gets more and more interesting. Um, so you know, if you're willing to offset you know, the cost of less fruit by you know, charging more, um, or if you're willing to offset it by you know, getting people to pay more because the, the wine itself is special, um, you know, then um, you know, you, you have a prize and, and you've learned something, you know, um, really profound uh, about, about grapes. And, um, you know, uh, vines will die um, of, you know, various blights on themselves, but they will live 300, they're 300 year old um, Tinto Pais vines um, in, in Chile um, because they don't have phylloxera for there. It, it's, it's crazy. Vines will live a, a very, um, you know, long time. And uh, it is, um, you know, uh, the, the old vines themselves are our treasures. I, I think, you know, you saw, you got a sense of uh, on that, um, you know, Lagar de Pintos um, image, you know, how, um, you know, thick that trunk was, you know, on that pergola trained vine. Um, and the vines, they're like olive trees. They start to take on personalities of their own and, and you know, uh, life forces of, of their own. And, and, you know, that certainly is, is, is worth, worth celebrating. You know, why would you throw that away after 20 years for the mere sake of, you know, a, a ton you know, or, you know, a few baskets more grapes every year. Um, great. Um, so, uh, do you have anything else, Thompson? Um, do you know the etymology of Albarino? I don't actually know. Uh, actually, 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 <laughs> I do. Uh, it comes from the Latin uh, for white. 
uh, comes from Latin for white, refers to um, a grape that is very pale uh, in, in color, not unlike myself. Um, so, uh, yeah. so that is, that is the etymology on, on Alvarino there. Um, we're moving on to Treshadura. Um, I do not know the etymology on Treshadura for the commenters uh, in the mix. It's a total one-off and happy accident. I promise I did not put Sarah up to that question just to make me look good uh, for the sake of the, uh, the linguists in the audience. Um, uh, I am not drinking the wine that, that most of you are drinking. Um, I would imagine if you provisioned uh, through uh, our online store. Sarah is. Uh, uh, the, the flower and the bee, uh, a triumph of packaging. Uh, it should be said, the flower and the bee. Um, Treshadora, uh, for those of you that, that are playing along at home, that is the pronunciation, uh, Treshadora. Um, Treshadora um, is uh, another native grape. Um, many of these grapes, Albarino, Treshadora, uh, Mentia, Gadeo, um, they exist kind of in this realm of both Galician and belonging also to Northern Portugal. Um, so historically, culturally, um, those regions kind of uh, grew up together. Um, and so you see different names for them on either side of uh, the border. Um, and uh, they are very much uh, important to um, winemaking on both sides uh, of the border. Uh, Treshadura, more often than not, is actually a blending agent. Um, I can remember trying um, the, the flower and the bee um, with my compatriot, uh, Allie, um, at uh, Tail of Goat um, when we were tasting for our spring list, uh, which was to be dedicated to these wines. And trying this one, thinking, Jesus, like this is the best single variety of Treshadora that I've ever had. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I don't want to damn it with faint praise because uh, it's a delicious wine, but honestly, I haven't had a lot of single varietal Treshadoras. They don't exist. Um, historically, oh, you had single varietal Treshadora on the opening Tail of Goat list, right? Uh, that is true. I did uh, uh, the Aire de los Moros. That was another unicorn. So I do love wine unicorns. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, but they're, there are not a lot of them. Um, and historically, actually, uh, to the extent that they did exist, uh, they existed in the guise of um, uh, what uh, the Galician called tostada. So um, these dried grape wines, um, which would have been dessert wines, which um, in antiquity um, really were the bee's knees, uh, so to speak. They, they tended to be um, the most prestigious wines in the world were um, uh, sweeter wines um, uh, in antiquity. Um, now, we are exploring a different region here. Uh, this is Ribeiro. Um, so uh, we are, you know, diving deeper into the land of 2,000 rivers. Uh, Ribeiro exists. Uh, so this is the Rio Minho um, that um, uh, kind of traces the border between Spain and Portugal initially. Um, and then the Rio Sil um, kind of proceeds uh, as a tributary. But um, along uh, the Minho, um, as it comes together with other tributaries, you have Ribeiro. Um, you're further inland, so you have less of the coastal influence um, so it's a little warmer here uh, than it is in other places, which means that uh, red grapes can ripen uh, a little more uh, readily uh, than they can in some other spots. And this, um, you're in a sub zone of uh, Ribeiro called the, the Val de Gomariche. Uh, so the uh, producer uh, takes its name from a uh, valley uh, within uh, the kind of larger sub region of uh, Galicia. Um, or a Ribeiro. Um, uh, the winemaker here um, is kind of newer to the scene, um, but uh, fascinating dude, um, great name. This is uh, uh, Jose Luis Cedillo. Uh, we are spelling Jose with an X because, you know, why not? Um, this is Jose. Um, so uh, cool picture, obviously. Um, what's the deal with the horn? Uh, well, um, Jose practices uh, biodynamic viticulture. Um, so if this was Pee Wee's Playhouse, the uh, couches we going like on fire. Biodynamic was like our secret word of the day. Um, biodynamics is a uh, form of farming. Uh, it is, you know, equally, um, you know, scientific in its own way, but um, kind of distilled from uh, centuries worth of Eastern European folk wisdom. Uh, it is... Um, based on a series of lectures given by a gentleman named Rudolf Steiner, who was an Austrian philosoph, uh, founder of the Waldorf School, among other things. Um, and in the wake of World War I, um, in the wake of the initial development of industrial fertilizing, um, which uh, exhausted the soils of Europe, um, he wanted to um, kind of go back to the land 
and revive um, more sustainable traditions of agriculture. So biodynamics is all about um, organic viticulture on one hand, um, so eschewing chemical intervention, modern chemical intervention, but also it's all about uh, considering the farm as a self-sustaining unit. So it encompasses not only the grapevines, uh, but the animals, the other plants, the people on the land. And ideally the whole farm itself is a single organism that is self-sustaining and self-perpetuating. Now, um, this embraces certain uh, somewhat uh, religious um, kind of rituals. Uh, in this case, Jose is showing off a horn um, that was used to prepare a fertilizer mix. So uh, under the biodynamic program, you would shove uh, compost and all sorts of other stuff in a horn, bury it underground for a uh, measure of months or years, um, dig it up uh, and catalyze that as a spray for your vineyards in lieu of other herbicides or fungicides. Uh, and, you know, at home, you're probably thinking to yourself, what a load of shit. You know, these guys, you know, are full of it. You know, it, what's the deal? Um, you know, it should be said that, you know, yes, um, there is a dearth of, you know, scientific method when it comes to the application of these methods. Uh, but it should further be said um, that, you know, we are uh, willing to live in the mystery. And uh, biodynamic farming is responsible for many of the uh, greatest wines uh, in the world. And it is something that this particular producer uh, has embraced uh, wholeheartedly. Um, they've gone even further and um, embraced the methods of uh, a Japanese farmer named Fukuoka. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, uh, a lesson uh, for another day. But they are looking for um, ways to work with the land that are um, more sustainable, um, you know, that are, um, you know, less, uh, uh, you know, intensive, that are um, kinder um, to the soil. They want to leave the vineyards for future generations. And, you know, I think uh, it's significant for the sake of Galicia as an older wine region that's been rehabilitated by a younger generation. I think you see that a lot in these lands that time forgot, these younger winemakers that are, um, you know, coming back to the land and, you know, wanting to um, resurrect these older vintage vineyards, but do so in a way that leaves a legacy. Um, and Gomarish is very much at the forefront of that movement in Galicia. Uh, Thompson, do you want to give them some tasting notes uh, for the sake of this particular offering? And uh, I believe you are unmuted. Am I unmuted now? You're unmuted, yeah. Uh, what are you tasting notes on the treasure door that you're drinking? Um, you know, honestly, I love, so I love Allie's tasting notes on this because I was reading them before I actually tried any of it. And it does have, like, it starts to go into this lightly Gewürztraminer territory when you smell it. Uh, Gewürz, for those of you playing at home, is a famously aromatic grape. Um, the German name Gewürz uh, for the linguists comes from spiced uh, in German. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tracy Dora. Um, Trechadura famously lower acid than Albarino, so um, hopefully those of you that have the Trechadura versus the Albarino, you'll notice that, you know, the acid is not quite as raging on this. Trechadura is more precocious. It's an early ripener. Um, it goes into, you know, sweeter wines. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's fleshier and super fun uh, that way, I think. And it has this beautiful, like, white, like I'm standing in the middle of a valley with a bunch of white flowers eating some kind of lemon curd. Yeah, who doesn't want that? Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, the, the name itself, the, the flower and the bee, you know, it's not just a clever marketing device. It actually, it actually tastes that way. But it's also a clever marketing device. But uh, um, it always reminds me of the blind lemon, uh, or blind melon, rather, the Chris Farley um, in a bee costume. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, I am drinking a Trechador um, that is a little more um, uh, traditional for the sake of being a, a blend, an all-encompassing blend. It's a bit of a kinship sink blend. Uh, mine is uh, Albarino, uh, Gadeo, Trechadura, uh, some Tarantes in the mix, and Caino Blanco. A word about Tarantes. Tarantes um, exist in Galicia, um, uh, but there are actually a lot of different um, subtypes of Tarantes that may or may not correspond to the most famous Tarantes, which is um, uh, it just come to Argentina um, and is usually like just gross, um, but occasionally can be aromatic and fun. Um, but at any rate, um, I, I think it's a fun wine, uh, first and foremost. And, and um, you know, I think both of these whites, they bring this lovely freshness 
uh, to the party that I think is, is something that um, is really intrinsic about Galician wine across styles, is that freshness, that brightness, that you know, quality of being food friendly. And I think it's consistent with the food too. Um, you know, a lot of you asked about pairings. The, the Galician cuisine um, is largely predicated on seafood. Um, so uh, they were historically famous fishermen. Um, uh, octopus um, is like the most famous dish. Traditionally, octopus with a boiled potato. Um, uh, pimientos de parrón, these like blistered peppers are hugely famous there. Uh, fresh fish. Um, to the extent that they're eating cheese, largely it's cow's milk cheese, but it's like a softer cow's milk cheese, but not like funky apois, just more kind of like, you know, fresh and, and, and farmer's cheese. It's humble. You know, this is like peasants cuisine. Um, and these are wines that you want to, you know, eat uh, along, alongside um, all of those things. And, and again, like, you know, I like the idea that they don't demand a lot. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of value to be had here uh, for the sake of them um, as well, which is, you know, always worth uh, celebrating. Um, lastly, I wanted to get to Gadeo. Um, a few of you might have Gadeo in the mix, um, uh, uh, and, and we sold some Gadeo through um, our uh, wine uh, store. I'm going to bring up uh, the map uh, that uh, you all have seen many times uh, before here, uh, but uh, it's a good map. Uh, maps are important. Wine is a map. Um, the Gadeo we're selling is from uh, Monterrey, um, uh, the Mountain of Kings. Um, so you're along the Portuguese border there. Um, there's a decent amount of uh, Gadeo that also comes from Valdareas, uh, it's the Valley of Gold. Very evocative names, um, kings, gold. Um, you know, we are, you know, uh, we're swimming. Uh, we are, you know, swimming in chips. Uh, at any rate, uh, Gadeo is a grape that requires a little more ripening. Um, it uh, is a little more versatile, honestly, than uh, the other two grapes that we've uh, taken on so far. Um, it's a little more Chardonnay-like. Um, you can make uh, Chablis like Gadeo, you can also make uh, rich, round, Cali Shard like uh, Gadeo. And I think it's really fun to play with uh, to that end. It's a grape that uh, people um, are coming around to and, and is really carving out a name for itself. And I think uh, a lot of the winemakers in the region are still kind of getting a fuller sense of um, how to work with um, because uh, you are further east and further removed from the maritime influence of the Atlantic um, in Valdez, Monterrey. It's a lot hotter. Um, you get a lot of more ripeness um, out of uh, the wines in those two regions and, and typically um, out of Gadeo, uh, more uh, broadly uh, speaking, uh, for the sake of those wines. Um, so um, we covered the white. Uh, did you want to hit me with any more questions about white wine before we move on to the race? Yeah. Actually, you talked a little bit about the, um, the Trechadoras that we're tasting, yeah. with them being primarily a single, single varietal and yours having a blend. Um, and Jennifer asked, actually asked a really good question about how much of the varietal, um, like what percentage of the varietal needs to be encompassed in the wine in order for the varietal to be listed on the label? Uh, that's an excellent question that I don't know the answer to, Jennifer. Um, so uh, those uh, regulations would vary um, uh, and they would be controlled by um, the DO. So there are five um, denominations of origin under the Spanish system in Galicia. Um, uh, in the case of the Trechadura, we're dealing with Ribero, um, and uh, Ribero, um, as a designation of origin, they would have a board that would regulate that, um, and decide uh, how much Trechadura had to be in the mix to call a wine Trechadura, um, and they would further decide whether Trechadura was allowed at all in wines called Ribero, um, and then furthermore, they would stipulate, you know, um, how much Trechadura could we produce in a given year and throw it into our Ribera wines? Um, and, you know, maybe how could we train the vines or what would the wine taste like on the back end? So um, all sorts of um, different stipulations that would be uh, regulated at a local level. Um, but I don't, I don't know what the requirements are, honestly, uh, for, for Ribera. Um, again, we're dealing with unicorns here um, and you're in an emerging, kind of an emerging wine region. So I imagine they would be a little more forward thinking about allowing the varietal itself to be put on the label um, for the sake of uh, branding their wines internationally. Um, typically, um, you know, Americans, international consumers tend to be kind of varietally obsessed for the sake of their wines. So they don't want to know that something is Ribeiro. They don't give a rat's ass about Chablis. They want to know Chardonnay. They want to know Trechadura. Um, and uh, usually in uh, regions that are, um, you know, younger in terms of their modern 
um, winemaking infrastructure, um, they'll be a little kind of faster on the feet uh, for the sake of labeling that way. All right, one last question before you move on. Um, Eloy just joined us. Um, and while you said that, <laughs> while you said that the, um, you know, mostly that up in the Northwestern Spanish region, that there are more similar similarities to Portugal. Um, but can you speak to the differences between maybe Alvarino and Alvarino? Um, there, honestly, there, um, it, it's a rose by any other name scenario. Um, so uh, one's Portuguese, one's Spanish. Um, I will say that um, you're moving south going into Portugal, um, but there are all sorts of mitigating circumstances. So um, uh, uh, Alvarino or Alvarino in Portugal, um, you know, just a terribly throw on, um, you know, <laughs> different, different accents, um, uh, often goes into, first and foremost in Portugal, in terms of the amount of wine produced, uh, Vino Verde. Uh, and Vino Verde is um, delicious, poundable, but it's, it's more of like a alcoholic Sprite, you know, situation. It's more of like a, you know, um, it's like more, um, you know, it's like the setter home. It's more socially acceptable setter home. Um, uh, if we're talking about varietally driven wines uh, in Portugal, I find that uh, Alvarino in Portugal um, is a little more substantive. It's a little fleshier, a little fuller. Um, you are a little fuller south there and maybe capable of a little more ripeness. And, and, and you know, most of the major Portuguese uh, wine making regions, they don't have the same maritime influence that a region like Rio de Janeiro does. So to the extent that there is single varietal Alvarino, in Portugal, and there is, and there, there, there's some amazing wines, um, and they, they pair really well with a lot of different food. I had this really special moment um, when I spent way too much money on lunch at uh, Le Bernardin once upon a time, but, you know, neither here nor there. Um, they, they just tend to be bigger uh, wines uh, than, um, than the, the Spanish equivalent, so that would be kind of like the, the quickest uh, answer, answer there, and I'd say uniformly, um, with the exceptions of stuff that's going into Vino Verde, which is kind of an outlier, because again, it's like a, it's like a self-contained wine spritzer, Vino Verde. And it's good. Like, I love that about it. You know, don't, no hate mail from the Vino Verde fans. But, you know, more serious wine um, from Portugal tends to be more robust. Um, and, and fascinatingly enough, um, and to the extent that Galicia was losing um, workers because there was no work to be had there, um, historically actually lost a lot of migrant labor to uh, port uh, country. Uh, for the sake of harvest, um, uh, just because uh, there was more money to be made there, there was more, um, there were more grapes to be brought in for the sake of um, a more thriving, uh, you know, uh, export business. Groovy. Um, so switching gears, red wine. Um, so uh, I want to start here. Um, what is uh, Galician wine not for the sake of the reds we're dealing with? Uh, I, I've had the experience um, as, you know, uh, a wine guy, what, however you want to, <laughs> for better or worse, call what it is that I do for a living, the preposterous way uh, that I've come to earn my daily bread. Um, but I've had the experience of people ordering red wine. And when you go to a table and someone asks for red wine, you know, uh, they're not asking for red across all categories. What they mean is, I want a big fucking red wine. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, I'm all for that. You know, um, you know, I like to slip into, uh, you know, uh, the right big ass red, you know, by the fire in the right moments with steak, etc. You know, those are, you know, fun, guilty pleasures. But um, uh, as I drink more, um, where I find myself wanting to land more for the sake of red is this uh, fun kind of savory mineral driven, um, you know, kind of uh, sheep and wolf's clothing or wolf and sheep's clothing, I think it's wolf and sheep's clothing, uh, kind of place for the sake of uh, these racier, lighter reds. Um, and that's what Galicia does. So you're not going to get Cali Cab um, in Galicia. There are, there are a few um, wines from um, the interior. We've got a Safra, Valdareas, etc. that start to tip the scales and that start to get more robust. But um, that is not um, what we're dealing with uh, here. Uh, these are light savory, bright, briny red wines, and unapologetically so. And, um, you know, there is um, something to be said for that. Um, you know, uh, in, in uh, Europe, they are in Spanish, they have a great, like, they're vinos gastronomicos, they're, they're gastronomic wines, which 
doesn't come across in English the same way because it sounds like super douchey, but um, they're ones you want to eat with. Um, and, and I love that. And, um, you know, I find, um, you know, uh, for the sake of the food at Tail Goat and Regular Sour, these are the wines that I want to um, drink with that food. And um, the first one up uh, for the sake of uh, the bundle um, is uh, from uh, Rias Baixas. So um, this is from the Maritime region. Um, and the bulk, the vast majority of plantings um, in Rias Baixas are to white grapes. Um, this is a bit of an outlier um, as such. This is Mentia Caino Nespadero. Um, Mentia um, is the most significant red grape in Galicia. Um, uh, it was thought to be derived from Cap Franc. It thought, was thought to be identical to Cap Franc. The origin story goes that, um, you know, the French monks that were traipsing their way um, to uh, see their sins forgiven um, with, you know, um, the, the pilgrimage or the, the pilgrims uh, along the Camino, um, they brought cuttings of Cap Franc with them that got rebranded Menthia. Um, in Galicia. Um, that was the origin story once upon a time. Um, and, and there is a lot of continuity because Menthia has this cool herbaceousness that's very reminiscent of a lot of like Loire Valley Cap Franc. Um, that is Total Bullock's um, uh, modern genetic evidence uh, has um, uh, uncovered uh, the actual origins of Menthia, which are actually Portuguese. It's a grape called Giant uh, as well, um, for those of you playing along at home. Um, and uh, it, it's just its own thing. Um, but what's cool about it is it's super herbal. And on top of that, it has this like a uh, pimentonish kind of charred red pepper tone uh, that I find hugely seductive. Uh, the one we're drinking is from Pedro Arlunga. Um, I love, so uh, this comes from um, uh, Francisco, uh, uh, Francisco y Miguel Alfonso. I don't know what Francisco's wife's name is. She looks amazing. She looks like his ride or die. I want to go to war with her. You know, I want her to have my back in all social situations. Like, you know, I just wish for more of her. Uh, at any rate, Pedro Lunga means big rock in the local uh, Gallego dialect. Um, and uh, they make a bunch of wines. Um, this is a lighter red uh, for their sake. And it's a field blend. And uh, that's very significant. Like the notion of single varietal wine, um, as we appreciate it, is a relatively modern phenomenon. Historically, especially in variable regions like Galicia, where there's always a struggle in places that are as close to the coast as V.S. Baixas, there's a struggle to ripen grapes. And from one year to another, it pays to have different grapes that ripen at different intervals and to have the same vineyard planted with multiple varietals. And it's, so it's not going to be the case that, you know, you have someone, you know, looking through a catalog and saying, you know, I want this clone of Menthia to plant all my vineyards with, you know, circa you know, 1900. It didn't work that way. Um, you know, they would propagate cuttings from neighbors and, you know, there'd be a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And maybe um, a particular producer would develop a house style, but it, it wasn't always varietally driven. It was more about their particular, um, what the Galician called terruño, which is their own, uh, you know, Spanish inflection on terroir. Um, I, I love, love, love uh, this wine. Um, it is, you know, uh, for what it is, you know, both profound and multifaceted and hugely delicious, but also light. You know, it, it, it belies this notion that uh, to be complex, uh, red wine has to be huge. It belies the notion that you have to throw massive amounts of oak at something for it to be interesting. You know, this is all stainless. Uh, there's some whole cluster in the mix um, uh, for the wine nerds. Uh, uh, that refers to the act of uh, leaving stems um, and uh, whole grape clusters in the mix during that initial maceration period. And the stems give you something more peppery, something more herbaceous for the sake of the wine. Uh, they also tend to knock down acidity a little bit, knock down alcohol, and they make for a more efficient uh, fermentation very often. But um, this is stupid good. Um, it's stupid good at 12% alcohol, which is like, you know, uh, again, like, you know, we don't, talk much about alcohol and wine, but um, it's fun to be able to drink more. You know, I, I, you know, my wife and I went on vacation in Germany and we got on a, a very dangerous but very fun, let's each drink a bottle of Riesling before we go out kind of uh, track because you can, because it's like 10 and 11 percent alcohol. Like that's, that's good. It's not a bad thing. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a fun one and, and it's just like, um, you know, for something that's as light and wildly thirst-crunching as it is, just really 
fabulous and, and interesting. Um, uh, all right, uh, that brings us, uh, lastly, uh, to uh, Laura uh, Lorenzo, who is a bit of a, a natural winemaking superstar. Uh, we're gonna go back to the map one last time, because uh, Laura is operating in Ribera Sacra, which we've not discussed um, to our detriment uh, as of yet. Um, Ribera Sacra um, is uh, the sacred banks, so named because there are so many monasteries uh, lining the banks of the river here. Um, you saw that map earlier with all the pilgrimage routes. Um, you needed all sorts of monasteries to service those pilgrims. And uh, monks make wine, which is what they do. So um, in Ribera, long history of winemaking. Um, the uh, region of Rias Baixas has five subregions. Uh, Ribera Sacra has five subregions as well. I'm not going to bore you with them, um, but those subregions actually mean something and they're actually worthwhile, unlike the subregions of uh, Rias Baixas. Uh, but Lora is in uh, the kind of um, easternmost um, subregion. Uh, it's called Quiroga y Bebe. Um, uh, Lora uh, is a total badass. Ribera is like these. You have the seal and the Mino converging. Um, the picture I showed earlier of how cartoonishly beautiful, or, or just, you know, the, the landscape um, in uh, Galicia was from Ribera. It's, it's this like amazing, um, you know, canyon-like, um, Grand Canyon-like, uh, but more verdant um, environment. Um, and it takes heroic work, truly heroic work, uh, to cultivate grapes and make wine there. Um, Laura is a proud daughter of the region. She's a fourth of nature. Um, uh, she has white dreadlocks, uh, so brace yourself. It's unfortunate. She's beautiful, uh, nonetheless. Um, uh, she's a total badass. Uh, she got the magazine treatment. Um, I want to know, you know, how I can get on the cover of this magazine. Uh, but at any rate, um, she's a bit of a natural wine demigod, and what she's done that's so cool um, is she's brought this kind of international perspective to the wines of this otherwise parochial region. So she uh, developed a love for wine at a young age and at 16 decided to be a winemaker, enrolled in a local enology school, trained in South Africa uh, with Evan Sadi, who's this natural winemaking demigod. It's funny, it's not uncommon to see that. And it's one of the really cool things about the global wine community these days is even in a, like a historic backwater like Galicia, um, you see this, um, you know, kind of exchange of knowledge and you have people coming, um, you know, from uh, harvest to harvest, uh, north and south to different regions and exchanging secrets. Um, and that's something that's very common in the young life of the cellar rat uh, because um, the most significant time in uh, the life of a vineyard is during harvest. And you can work, um, you know, let's say, you know, August or September through November in the Northern Hemisphere and then go to the Southern Hemisphere and work their harvest in our spring. Um, and that way, just kind of uh, multiply your knowledge. And that's something that almost everybody does. Um, and, you know, even in otherwise stodgy regions, everybody does. Um, you know, I, I helped uh, organize a Riesling conference um, this past year. And, um, you know, you have these like stodgy uptight Germans that are, you know, telling these ribald stories about partying with Aussies because they make that exchange. And I think that's totally worth celebrating. Uh, for the sake of someone like Laura, what's really cool is that um, she's gone kind of back to the future. So she has um, this unparalleled love of old vine source material. So she is really seeking to revive these abandonados, these older plots, these vineyards that, you know, may not even be planted to grapes that you know, are readily identifiable. And she's saying, you know, these are special vineyards and I want to work with them. And not only that, but I want to work with them in a really low intervention style. So uh, we have yet to, for the sake of our wine class, really to dive deeply uh, when it comes to, air quotes, natural wine. Um, Laura is very much a natural winemaking demigod. Um, you know, we will, you know, devote, you know, future classes to that subject, but um, she is very hands-off. Um, so, um, you know, she doesn't use a lot of sulfur at bottling, which can be an important preservative, but she also favors a style of winemaking that employs a lot of uh, whole cluster. So she's making wine in a more Beaujolais Nouveau-ish kind of style. Um, we have two wines on offer from her. One is called Tabernario. Um, it is ridiculously light. Um, it's a bit of a lemonade out of lemon situation because in this vintage, um, she wasn't able, 
uh, to make some of her single crews because the weather was not favorable. So she plucked some red grapes and a few white grapes uh, in the sake, uh, or for the sake of Palomino from some of her parcels and threw them in the mix together and made something that personifies this French notion of what they call glue glue. Uh, glue glue um, is basically French for glug glug. Uh, the idea is it's a red wine that you can slam. Um, and uh, the other wine that you guys have in the mix, the Portello de Vento, is her kind of slightly more prestigious uh, version of the same. Um, they are both uh, derived from Enthia. Uh, they're both easier drinking uh, versions of um, the Pedro Lunga. Um, they are racy and acid driven and, you know, depending on the bottle, sometimes they have a little bit of a pin prickle like um, uh, petulance or acidity um, or, you know, even carbonation. And that's, you know, kind of intentional. Um, it can be a bit of re-fermentation in the bottle because there's not a ton of sulfur in the mix. Uh, but, you know, the wine's not bad, you know, um, you know, uh, the milk's still good. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's an intentional, um, you know, desire. Um, for, you know, what she's making. She wants to be something fun and fresh and easy drinking. You know, this is not a, you know, let's go to the steakhouse and impress clients kind of wine. It's, you know, wine that you, you know, sit around the table with uh, friends uh, and, and enjoy. And that's very much how uh, Laura conceptualized it. And, you know, for me, uh, that's the best of what um, the Gallegos um, have to offer. So, um, uh, Thompson, I promise we'll get to um, uh, questions here. I just want to wrap things up while we're at um, the hour mark, um, uh, if folks are going to uh, leave us. Um, thank you for staying on the line, as always, uh, this long, uh, everyone, 200 plus of you uh, today. Um, uh, shameless plug, um, flying blind, flying blind. If you want to dive deeper down this rabbit hole and see me embarrass myself, um, uh, Thursday at 7, uh, yet another Zoom link. Um, uh, you can buy the wines uh, through uh, Tail Up Goat uh, this week only. Uh, they will be specially wrapped by Birthday Girl. So, Rebel yeah, from, sorry? Reveler's Hour, not Taylor. Yeah, hour. Sorry, sorry. Uh, they'll be specially wrapped by Zoe. Um, so you will not know what they are either um, when they come to you. Um, we will have a uh, note cards in an envelope for you to seal, like unseal rather, like Oscar voters um, if you miss class. Um, so it's a, a true blind tasting experience for you um, at, at home. Um, and uh, it can be an interactive experience um, if you, if you want to enjoy it. So uh, just another way uh, to uh, nerd out. Um, with your friends at Tail Up Goat uh, and Revolution. Um, so for the sake of today's class, um, you know, again, wanted to celebrate uh, the way that uh, Galician wines, you know, subverts traditional expectations of uh, Spanish wine. Um, you know, when you talk about any country um, for the sake of, you know, anything that is related to art or culture, you know, it's important not to, um, you know, paint everything with the same brush. You know, yes, a lot of Spanish wines are big and red, but they're not all that way. Um, and, you know, um, more often than not, you know, the most interesting things coming out of place are the exceptions uh, to the rule. And, um, you know, uh, for the sake of Galician wine, it's been fun uh, to celebrate that diversity, to celebrate uh, those uh, local origins. And, you know, lastly, um, you know, I've, I've been to Catalonia. I haven't really been to Spain. I've been to Barcelona, which is kind of a different thing entirely. Um, I've never been to Galicia. Uh, I have a, a really um, good uh, near and dear friend who uh, spent a year in Spain and said that it was his favorite, favorite part of the country and I, I would love to go there sometime but you know what I love about wine is that you know having um, you know consumed these things and having read about them got deeper into them you know I feel a kinship um, with the people and with the place and with the drink and I feel like I know something you know deeper um, about it because you know I have you know consumed something that is so intrinsically in uh, and of it and um, you know, you kind of have to, you have to work at that. You have to train yourself to be sensitive to it. But, um, you know, um, that is one of my favorite things uh, about uh, wine done well. And, 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 you know, we're celebrating uh, for our sake while we are all, you know, isolated at home. So uh, as always, uh, alone together, uh, cheers to you all. I love you guys. Yeah, that's good. Um, Thompson, what do you got for me? Yeah, a few things. Um, so, uh, Tim wants to know why he wasn't invited to the Riesling conference. <laughs> uh, so, Let's get the important questions out. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, I, I, so the, the official name of the recent conference was FL Excursion. Uh, we are preparing for not, um, this is 20, 2020, but 2021, there will be a new, there will be another edition of FL Excursion. Everybody's invited. Um, uh, uh, Tim, this is my first 
um, year on the steering committee for the sake of FL excursion. And, you know, I had to, it was a bit of a Joseph Campbell kind of hero's journey for me in the midst of all that. So it was a bit of a night's quest. It was a bit of uh, something that I had to tackle by myself uh, for the sake of the first go round. Um, uh, for the sake of the second iteration, it will get much more Bacchanalian. Uh, there'll be some kind of group house experience. It'll become kind of like, uh, yeah, exactly. Andy Cohen sponsored, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tail of Goat House uh, life uh, at any rate. We'll, we'll make that all happen. But um, that will come to you for the sake of uh, the Finger Lakes wine experience. It, it's a very special place. And, uh, you know, we will devote, um, you know, uh, more, um, you know, breath to that at a, at a later point in time. All right, to, to speak actually towards Galicia, um, can you talk about some of the bigger red varietals in Galicia and then also what temperature you would usually drink the reds at? Um, so for the sake of temp, yep. um, I want these colder. You know, I want these, these, these to be colder than, um, so, you know, a little cooler than solid temp, maybe like upper 50s, lower 60s uh, at the highest. Um, you know, for the sake of, of something like Laura's wine, you know, for me, this almost drinks like a white, you know, I must want this like at orange wine temp. Um, this is like, it always fascinates me about the- uh, What's orange wine temp for the masses? I don't know, somewhere between white and red. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> not usually, like this, this motion right here, sir. I'm not, I'm not great about the, the science of all that. Like, so, so hypothetically you're serving whites like somewhere between 42 and 48. You know, I, I don't know, who's, who's, who is, I guess maybe people, people have access to thermal, thermo like, thermometers. I guess we're getting more exacting about our temperature taking these days, but, um, you know, to use the home, I think the home fridge should be the barometer. So, um, you know, taking a wine directly out of a home fridge and serving it is like only, a, should only really be a thing for sparkling wine. Um, if you're drinking white wine, you know, give it at least half an hour. You know, if you're drinking, um, you know, orange wine, give it an hour. So, you know, maybe treat this like that. That's kind of how I treat it this for the sake of class. Um, you know, um, conversely, uh, you know, most red wines serve too hot, give it half an hour to an hour in the fridge prior to, to drinking. I, I think like, you know, how much time in a home fridge is almost a better barometer than, you know, degrees Fahrenheit. Unless you have a wine cave, in which case more power to you. <laughs> um, and an overarching question, and actually I'm gonna speak to one thing really quickly, which is your amazing ability to blind taste. So I will put a little pitch in for the blind tasting thing because watching Bill blind taste no. is one of the no, no, no. funnest things I've ever, no. ever had the <laughs> the pleasure of. Wait uh, to it up for everyone, Thompson. He's really animated and excited and, you know, you think he's animated now, just wait until the blind tasting class. No. Um, but people outside of the D.C. area are actually wondering uh, what their options will be um, and whether we'll, maybe Zoe can wow. sell an email separately that you won't be aware of? I didn't, that hadn't even occurred to me and it speaks to um, our reach for the sake of this program. And into it. Um, again, you know, love to you all, never imagined ever doing anything like this, um, let alone wearing my own face while doing something like this. So, um, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 no, it's awesome. Um, yeah, we, we wanna, you know, the bigger we can make this, the better. Um, so. Uh, reach out to reach out to Zoe or just honestly just just um so for the sake of you know uh, getting on it fast um, hello at or wine actually we have a wine school wine school either either, either write wine school at tail goat or we have a separate <laughs> now, um, uh, revelers hour wine school email handle so either wine school at tail goat or wine school at Revel revelers hour better yet that that Zoe is um, in charge of maintaining uh, and we'll we'll make that happen for you for the sake of provisioning. Um, we're not in a position ourselves uh, to uh, ship wine um, in you know the current you know legal regime, um, but there are a lot of people who are, um, uh, and there are a lot of really amazing. I, I don't think so. Like when I want to buy something myself that's like specific, I'll usually order it. Well, I like to support local retailers, but like if I'm really looking for something, I buy it online. Um, uh, two of my favorites. I had three favorites, honestly, uh, that are um, uh, two in New York, um, Astor uh, mm -hmm. and Chambers Street, um, and then one in LA. I think that, I think K&L actually is not, I think they're just doing California now because of pandemic, but um, yeah, they're, they're great. They're all great.
And you have to promise in front of all 172 current participants that you will not go into the wine school at Revelers. Um, so I, I was actually, so Zoe engineered a massive box that will Instagram that is like the containment vehicle for the wine school wines. Because um, for those of you, you know, that, that don't do this for a living, obviously there's a fear that, you know, when this wine comes in from our merchants that I'll casually, you know, glance at a case that I know and that will ruin the roost. But I, I, Zoe's been advised, she's taken the necessary, so we have like a wine, like Jimmy hat for lack of a better word, in the wine room, a prophylactic for the wine school wines so that I have no idea what I am drinking come uh, Thursday. So I'm, 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 I'm very excited uh, about that. And I, I, I'm, I scout's honor, I promise. Like I don't wanna violate the trust, you know, if anyone's gonna look like an ass, I want to be me because it'll be more entertaining for the sake of the viewing public when it when it comes to these exercises. So, you know, yeah. Heidi says you can trust that we can trust you because you wear yourself on your shirt. Ah, yeah. Does that make me more or less trustworthy, Heidi? I, I just I just I just don't know. I'm I am excited that uh, one of these shades matches Heidi's hair for those of you not playing along at home, which is which is very very exciting and very meta for the sake of uh, the tail of goat commentary. That's all I got. <laughs> oh, wow. No more, no more Galician questions. Wow. Um, awesome. Uh, so guys, I'm, I'm hugely excited. Just, just a, a bit of a, a spoiler alert. We're going to be doing uh, Shannon um, come uh, next Sunday, which I know a lot of people have been asking for. We're going to have a, a special guest uh, for the sake of a really lovely woman who's a negociant um in uh the lore valley uh and we'll have all the secrets to share for the sake of shannon but um yeah thanks again uh for you all um for joining us every sunday and um you know uh making this what it's become um you know i'm hugely hugely grateful to you all and um you know hope you all are uh safe and sound and isolating and style